Okay, I think uh, uh, we can slowly start with the uh, questions uh, raised in the last week, uh, and then we can move the lecture today. Right, good. Uh, so in the, uh, let me start with the lecture last week. In the last week, what we did, uh, we discussed on major uh, protocol which use on the online communication, that is uh, TLS protocol. Uh, and we studied how this TLS works and what is the role of public infrastructure when establishing this TLS sessions and so on and so on. I remember uh, there were several questions which unanswered. One is uh, one student asked uh, about this food will attack. So uh, let me start from there. Uh, I'm sharing my uh, slides. Uh, give me a minute. All right. Uh, food attack. Uh, so basically, uh, the food attack kind of this, uh, uh, started somewhere around 2014 as I, I studied that. Uh, now it's uh, not anymore unless otherwise you are still using SSL version 3. SSL version 3 is kind of buggy version. So we recommend to use TLS 1.2. There are TLS 1.3 also exists right now. But some web servers, when they configure it, they, they still use SSL version 3 to provide the backward compatibility. That means if there are any clients which don't have the TLS 1.2 implemented, so if you only support TLS 1.2, so that particular client cannot connect to your uh, server. So because of that, some server admins still keep SSL version 3 supports in their web server configuration. So I check everywhere, they highly recommend or highly discourage not to do that. So kindly disable SSL version 3 when the configuring web servers. So this particular attack will stand for padding Oracle downgrade legacy encryption attacks targeted SSL version 3. So the attacker, what they do, they establish kind of man in the middle session with your web server and let your web server to downgrade your security to version three. If you say in the server, you are supporting version three. If you are saying in the server, you are not supporting version three, attacker cannot do so that. Uh, there is a, when you do the block encryption in the symmetric key, there is a, what we call it as encryption modes. There, there is an encryption mode called CBC mode. In this CBC mode, there is a scheme called padding, which may to make it kind of exact blocks. So actually the attacker used those padding blocks and made the server to decrypt their content one byte at a time. So that was refers to as Poodle attack with SSL version three. Uh, so basically, the, how do we mitigate it? I don't configure your web servers to downgrade to SSL version 3. So configure your web servers with TLS 1.2 or higher. So then this attack is, uh, may not any more effect to you. Right. Uh, so that is one, one thing. Other thing, uh, other question. But I, other, 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 other thing what I left to do is, uh, so some students ask, how do you configure uh, certification authority or, or CA server, certification authority server. Uh, so they are, uh, so I will show you that first, uh, uh, how to configure, uh, certification author authority for yourself. For that, I use OpenSSL, Open OpenSSL connection. Um, uh, uh, so, in the using OpenSSL tools, if you try to set up your own ZA, it has several actually 
uh, several configuration to be done. Uh, plus, uh, command is kind of little complicated. Because of that, I have given some scripts. Uh, I forward to that. Uh, maybe you can share that with the participant. Did you get it? I mean, hello. I think uh, you have forwarded it to the participants, I guess. So using those scripts, uh, I will show you how to set up your own certification authority. Uh, uh, there is a uh, zip file which I forwarded to the you calling uh, CA server zip, right? So download that and unzip it. So uh, I will share my window and show how it works. Uh, give me a minute to share it. Uh, right, uh, I will share my entire desktop so it's easy. Right, uh, so, so you see my uh, folder. So you should get a file called ZA server zip. So using this ZA server zip file, uh, you can uh, set up your own certification. Of Let me unzip it. Uh, so I just unzip it in my Mac OS. Uh, so when you unzip that, uh, you may get a folder called ZA server. So you go inside to that folder. There you might see some files. Uh, so there is a file, readme file. When you open this readme file, uh, you can see some instructions how to use those scripts which I created. Uh, and uh, uh, this is readme. And then there is a file called SSL tags. So that shows how do you set up a SSL web server in brief. And then there are four, four files three scripts and one configuration file. So CA server con is the configuration file for the certification authority, which we're going to set it up right now. Uh, so maybe you can open that in the test editor and see those configuration lines. So it has uh, several configurations like your CA default names and things like that. How long you're going to show your certificates and things like that. You see the here, certification authority names. You can change that if you wish uh, in the configuration. And then uh, the period you are showing public key certificates and all other configurations are there in the configuration file. You can slowly go through that leisurely this configuration file and change those configuration if you wish uh, later on. Right, so this is the configuration file. And then there are three scripts I have given. First script to create your own certification authority. So this script actually consists of uh, open SSL command. Let me open this create CA scripts, which I created. So you see in this script, there are some initialization of directories at the beginning. After that, I do create a simple certification authority by creating self-signed certificate for the CA. So this is command highlighted one is the command, open SSL command to create self-signed certification authority for a CA. Right? I have given that in the script. So what you should do is you just run that script at the terminal. So I am at this uh, directory now. Let me change to that. So this is the directory. Uh, if you want to set up a certification method, obviously you should have OpenSSL installed. And then you run this script uh, called uh, CS uh, uh, create uh, create uh, create uh, CA script. This script. Uh, so kindly run those on the Linux terminals because when the when I write in this script I use black shares. If you try to run it in the Windows, so it's the other one, right? Uh, so the, the it may not work. Uh, so the scripts uh, written for the Linux based system. 
any Linux based or the Mac system which has OpenSSH installed, this script will work. Right. So the first thing what you have to run is uh, create CS script that will set it up a very simple certification authority. So you see it will set some directories for store the certificates, private keys and so and so. And then it created the RSA 1024-bit key for the certification authority. If you want to have a bigger key size, look at this EA configuration file. There you can change the key size of the certification authority. Right. So then after that, it has a uh, password to protect the private key of certification authority. You can type a password. So you have to remember that password because you need that to sign certificates later on. Right. So now private key has generated and save it in the uh, protected directory. And then now it asks the uh, distinguished names or the name of your certification authority. When you are naming a certification authority, you have to give a few parameters. What is your country? It's two letter country code. So I have given LK. So this data is taken from the configuration file. You can change the configuration file or you can type it here. So, so if I want to use default, you just press enter. So I am using default, really. My province is Western, locality is Colombo, organization is University of Colombo, unit is School of Computing. Uh, then it has the common name of the certification authority. Maybe I say UCSC CA or something like that. Maybe Bangladesh CA, whatever you can write here. Maybe if you wish, you can say where is I here. It doesn't matter. Whatever the name uh, you are typing here, they will take it as the name of your certification authority. Uh, then it has the email and the web. You can skip those. And you see, after you enter those details, the script has generated a self signed certificate uh, for your CE. So this is your self signed certificate of CE. And it displays on the terminal. Then uh, this is actually your private key. Uh, you can keep a backup of your private key in a secure place uh, and so on. So then after press enter, the system is set it up. So you have the CD. So in this uh, directory SSL, the system will uh, script will automatically create a directory called SSL CA. There you can see a certification authority certificate is in there. And your private key is stored, is stored in this particular directory. Your private key of your certification authorities is saved there in this directory, encrypted with the password which you have typed. Uh, certificate is just in plain in the store in the directory. Right. Now you have set it up a certification authority. Let's say you want to issue a certificate for yourself or a server. So if you want to issue a certificate to yourself, uh, uh, there is a uh, file called create user certificate SSH. There is again a script file. Inside that file, you can see the uh, commands, uh, open SSL command. So you can have a look later on. I will run that uh, file now. Right? So then, uh, when it runs that, so it's creating a certificate to yourself. Uh, so it has the parameter of you, use, end user. Uh, so I say I'm Shunanka, Western, Alambu, School of Computing. And there you have to type your name. You are the owner. So basically the personal certificates like that we are going to create can be used to encrypt and decrypt emails. There is a standard called S1, which use those public key certificates. So I will discuss that in later on some other lecture. I will use that certificate and show you how to use that. So in case you want to use that for the email communication, you might type, you have to type your correct email address here. Otherwise, the emails of Tami may not allow you to import that certificate. So you have to type correct email, which you're going to use. So, so I type my correct email, which I'm going to use it, and then uh, it asks the challenge, so you can skip these two steps. Finally, it asks a password for the CA key, certification authority password. I type that. 
So you see, script automatically generated certificate for yourself now. So now it has to commit that to your uh, folder, whatever uh, your certification certificate database. So I say yes, commit it uh, and confirm it. So it's added, right? Uh, database updated with the certificate. After that, so that certificate and the private keys in the CA. But you need to use it now. So for that, we have to export it to, to a file and give it to a particular user. As I had been no certification authority, we need to extract those uh, keys and you, the certificate of that particular user and give it to him. For that, um, there is a format of exporting the public key and uh, uh, public key certificate and the private key. That is called it as PKCS2L format. So when you're exporting keys on the PKCS2 format, uh, some people call it as PFX files, uh, you have to give a password to protect that particular file. So it, that, it has a password for that. So it has to re-enter the same password, right, done. So that file is exported. So when you go back to that, you may see now several files in this folder. Uh, beginning they have only few, these three files, now there are several files. You see, this is a user certificate request file created by these scripts. If you wish, you can submit that request to the real certification authority out there. They may recognize it and issue a certificate for you. Then this is your private key. This is your certificate created just now. So all these two bundle into this PFX file. If you wish, you can export uh, to a browser or a web system, right? So I will show you how to export it into a browser. So I, for that, I am using a Firefox browser. In the Firefox browser, go to the Edit Preferences and in and Secure Privacy and Security tab. Somewhere down, you can see the Certification tab. So I show you in the last week there are Certification Authority uh, listed there. Maybe you see there is a UCSC CA, so I will delete it. Any certification authority in this list, you, at any time you can delete it. Uh, I say delete that CA, so there are no University of Alam certification authority in this list anymore. And then you see there are certificates which created by me in previous demonstrations. I will delete that as well. So now um, when you go back to view certificates, there are no uh, certificates for me maybe i have to exit and start the browser uh, let me start the browser there and go to edit uh, preferences then there should not any certificates in the list yes you see there are no uh, certificate for me and then there are no certification authority code ucc ca known to this particular browser right now we have set up all, all certification authority and I'm going to now export uh, my keys to this browser. So in there, so we have just created the, uh, the CA server and this is the file, user.pfx file, recognized by all the browsers in the world kind of. So all the browsers knows about this format of the file. So you can open that. So when it open it, it has a password because this file is password protected. So when you give a password, you see these keys are imported into your browser. Similarly, this key can be imported to your offline email client, like Thunderbird or whatever offline email clients to have e secure email communication. And so after import, you have to do one more thing. So let's have a look on this certificate. You see it's certificate they showed to me issued by the UCSCCA we just created right now, uh, right? So, but in the top it say could not verify. Why it could not verify? Because this CA is unknown to this browser, right? So we can make that known to the browser. How do you do so? You go to the authority tab and find this CA. You see now it's, uh, it's listed here. So then if you want to be make a trusted CA, there is a button called Edit Trust. So you go to that and then you say this CA is trusted by your staff. So now this certification authority 
is trusted as other certification authorities in this list, like Verizon, DGZ, so whatever. Similarly, it's trusted by only this particular browser because the other browsers may not be aware of your certificate. So, all right. So now we go to a view certificate, you see, is verified. Now it's correct certificate there. So what kind of purposes we can use this certificate in the browser? Actually in the TLS, there is an option, what we call it as a user authentication. I mentioned that, so authentication is partial in typical TLS. Browsers authenticate web servers. Web server may not authenticate the browser in this typical TLS connections. So in case you need a, you have high security application, yeah, you have to authenticate the users as well using public key certificates. You could make it like that. You can import your user certificates into the browser. And when you configure in your SSL CS, there is an option you, say, you have to tell. Client authentication is mandatory. Yeah, in their option, you have to tell you need to do a bi-directional authentication. In that case, this particular TLS server look for public key certificates installed in the browser. If there are no public key certificates installed in the browser, they may not let that user to connect this particular website. By doing that, we can kind of establish a SSL VPN uh, between your browser and the server. Only the people who have certificate issued by yourself will let to connect these servers. So that's a simple way of setting it up as a SSLVP. Uh, so this is how we did that. So your certificate is set it up now. That is almost ready to use it. Right. Now uh, you may ask how to create a certificate for your web servers. So for that I have given another script in this folder. So as you may see in the folder, uh, there is a, another script called uh, uh, create uh, host certificate. You run that script. So that will create a, a public key certificate for a TLS enabled web server. So when you run that, it again asks the particular distinguished names, attributes of your certification authority. You give it, you can type it there, but I use default values. Uh, and when you they, when it asks the common name, this common name field, you must type your web server domain name. That is mandatory. So if you don't type it, that particular certificate may not accept by these browsers. Uh, so you have to type domain name of your web server there. Uh, so if you have no IP address, you can type the IP address as well. So maybe I say localhost. So if I want to use it in the local house, like that, uh, you have to use, that's the mandatory field. Uh, you have to remember to type correct domain name. Right, email address is optional, and you can skip this challenge thing. And then again, it asks the password for the certification authority. You have to type that password. So then the certification authority sign the certificate for your web server. So, so you say commit and accept it. So all, all done. So now you have uh, created a certificate for your web server yourself by using your own certification authority. So when you go back to the directory, you may under, uh, identify there are several other files. Among them, uh, so host certificate request file, this one, uh, this one, highlighted one, is the file what we call it as public key certificate request. You can send that request to other commercial certification authority as well. So then they can certify your public keys if you wish. Uh, actually, otherwise, you can use uh, they, they basically uh, your own uh, certification authority to certify that. That's what I did here. So then there is a, a field called Hosky field. Hosky file. There is a file called Hosky. Hosky file consists of the private key of the uh, web server. Private key of the web server. Then host certificate is your public key certificate of the web server. So you can put those certificates in your 
SSL configurations and then you change the configuration to load those certificates. So then your web server will use those certificates in this TLS connection. So if you want to see how we, how we do it with the Apache web server, I will later uh, demonstrate that. Or else you can see a search on the internet. There are plenty of tutorials on the internet how to set up a TLS web server. So they are they set to give the uh, key key file and the certificate file. So in these places you can use these two files. So this is your key file. This is your certificate file. All set it up. So with your own CE. So where is the certificate of your own CE? It is in the CA SSL CA directory. Uh, so in there, there, this is your CA certificate file. And your CA private key is in there. And all the certificates you have created will be listed down here. So we have created only two certificates so far. So you see, this is a very simple certification server, CA server, which works at the prompt. You can use it for internal purposes. So for example, within your organization, if you want to set up a internal SSL VPNs and internal web server, and use it for some works to write some web application, use it for some web application, you can use it. So you feel free to use my scripts, no problem with that. So I have given those scripts. So you go through the scripts, try those. With those scripts, you can run your own certification authority. Uh, so that is about the demo on CS. Uh, so I, I like if, uh, to take few questions if you have, because I don't know whether you understand it or you can confuse. Uh, so I like to take few questions, like four or five questions from the audience, uh, whether you understand that. Any questions, if you, you can type it, so then I can answer if you, if, if this is not clear. I mean, are there, are there any questions? I mean, are you here? Please yes, ask me a question. Yes. You can go ahead if you have any questions. So, I mean, your microphone is enabled. You can ask. I like there is a question typed. It asks, is this way? Can I use my web server? Yes, you can use. You can use the two files which I show. These two files, uh, host key PEM and certificate key PEM, uh, which is kind of configured on your web server. So uh, that works. That will enable the uh, CA. But is if you have your own CA, you that CA is not known to the other people. So if you go public, so then other people's browser may not know about this your CA, then that browser may get warnings. Because of that, if you do this method, I recommend only for internal application, internal use. So if you want to set up a public open web servers, you have to go for pre-certification authorities such as less centric. Okay, Nure Jahid, are you here? Yes, I can hear. Okay, ask your question. So I cannot hear the question. Please ask your questions. You raise hand means ask a questions for uh, the, our okay. instructor. Our instructor is ready to give you answer. So maybe he, he didn't, uh, I couldn't hear him. Maybe his mic is mute, I guess. His microphone is unmute. Okay. Yes. No, I couldn't hear. Okay, there was a question type. Maybe he can type if he couldn't. Uh, okay. Uh, he can type. So there was a question typed by uh, Kumar. 
So saying is that mean, mean we can create secure connection between two pieces uh, uh, having the certificate. Yes, it's possible. So you can set up a SSDNS web server with one certification authority, host certification authority, and then in the client browsers, you can issue the public key certificate for the end users. So then between the client browser and your web server, we can have encrypted end to end encrypted connection. Then Samin asked the question, is this process the same for a Windows uh, IIS server? Yes, so when you create the certificate, so those certificate can be used for any servers. It doesn't matter. IIS or Apache or Node, whatever the uh, Nginx servers, you can configure it because the certificate created in the common standard format, right? So, the, uh, but the scripts which I given only runs on Linux, so that's the problem. So, but you can look at the open SSL space and you can type it, customize it for the windows. That's problem with the backslash. You know, the I use backslash in the scripts. So forward slash used by the windows. I think that's the problem. It don't work in the windows. But the scripts or the command is same in the open SSL, open SSL install. Using the same commands, you can create certificates. It doesn't matter you create certificate in the Linux system or a windows system. So whether you use it in the IIS server or Apache server, it doesn't matter. They all interoperable because they use a standard format. And then there is a question for There is a question type from Pradeep Kumar. Yes, can we use this certificate in our firewall for secure? Yes, you can use. You can use. Then you have to uh, install the CEA into the client certification uh, uh, client browsers if you want to use it in the firewall for deep packet inspection i will come to the next actually this firewall uh, one deep packet inspection uh, uh, right maybe i move on so uh, there is another one question i'll answer that and move on how can we uh, get your scripts there? Uh, how can we get you the scripts have passed already can you share it with the uh, students? I think, right? So, no, none will share it, the scripts and the slides. I have passed that scripts and the slides already uh, to the uh, uh, people who handle these sessions. They will put it on the website so you can get it there. Don't worry, I will uh, provide those scripts. You can study those scripts and use those scripts your uh, activities. Uh, and then there was a question from, do we need to configure with all client browsers or we just configure on the web, web, web server? Uh, no, no. So if you want to use this and set it up an uh, encrypted connection between browsers and the web servers, so you, first of all, you have to configure web server certificate. Then you can have an encrypted session. In case you want to go for bi-directional authentication, that means you need to authenticate not only the web server, but also the client browser. So then you have to individually install the user certificates in the client browser. Server certificate should install in the web server. That is only one place. And so that will set up an encrypted session. So in case you want to do a client authentication, user authentication, you have to create a user certificate for individual users and install that in the individual browsers. And how browser get information about CA, uh, name of the work. So basically when you install a, a certification, uh, your certificate to the browser, so CA certificate is automatically comes. Otherwise you have to manually install uh, your CAs in the browser. So there you should go for a certification authority, view certificate, go to authority and say import, and then pick the certificate you want to import. So in my example, a CA server certificate is here. Here, yeah, say it and open. So I have already installed. So then I don't do it right now. So you just pick it or open. This is installed CA. So that has to be done for each and every browser because that CA is new for you, new for those browsers. 
because of that, you have to do it for it and the browser. So that is not practical for a large application, but it is practical for uh, small applications which are within the organization. Right. I think with that I can move, otherwise we may not have enough time to finish the lecture today. I will take the questions at the end back, right? Uh, so the next thing what I want to show you is uh, this. Uh, so we discussed about TLS, you know, uh, this established encrypted channel between the browser and the web server. So the, let's say this is your browser, browser, a web server in the World Wide Web web server, and this is the browser running on your machine. So basically, it set up an encrypted channel between these two. That usually happen. So in the TLS, so that is end-to-end -end encryption channel. That means no one at the middle cannot break it. However, so there are some techniques to break it. So those techniques used by bad guys as well as good guys. So when it's used by the bad guy, we call it as man in the middle attacks. If it is used with the good guy or the network admins, we call it deep packet inspection. So, so why they call it deep packet inspection? For example, so if someone used this TLS talk, I will take it later on as well. So your firewall is somewhere at the middle. So, so this data is encrypted. Actually, your firewall cannot see this information. So your firewall is blind. So because of that, firewall may not be able to detect intruders. In case firewalls want to detect intruders, they have to break the SSL at the middle. So how do they break the SSL at the middle? They somehow, let's say this is your firewall or HTTP, HTTPS inspection uh, firewall to do this kind of inspection of those intruders. So those firewalls, what they do, they kind of cheat the end user. By cheating this end user, the end user SSL or the TLS connection will break it here. So after it break it here, this firewall will examine this traffic and re-encrypt back to the end server. This end server may not detect it breaks here. Uh, plus you may not detect uh, somebody is break your connection here. So if you do this break connections here, so so usually personally I don't like that. So I don't like this HTTPS inspection or what you call it as deep packet inspection. I I I I, I, I packet inspection basically. Uh, uh, I don't like this uh, concept. Uh, there is a reason for that. Uh, which I don't like because what what doing that what we do is we open a hole we open a uh, central vulnerability point so this this server or whatever appliance which do that can listen to entire traffic so they have break this TLS so they can listen to entire traffic so that means your car credit card numbers your password whatever your confidential data, this man can listen. So we assume this man is a reputed firewall, but who knows? So somebody has hacked into that. Who knows? Firewall admin will listen to that and so on. So if in case you are deployed a packet inspection firewalls, you need to be very careful to monitor this guy, which break the connection. Plus the people who admin this need to be trusted. Because if some administrator who admins, admins can listen entire confidential communication in the organization, that is, I feel not a good practice. So because of that, I usually, as a security professional, not recommend to do the packet inspection. So, it's, but most of the organization do it these days. Even some governments are doing it. Uh, so it is designed to run end-to-end -end like that. So nobody at the middle should be able to listen that. So then it is not ethical, someone break it at the middle. So maybe similar to uh, firewall, some, some uh, hacker will break it. Then there are no difference between the firewall admin and the hacker. Both are doing the same unethical thing. So because of that, I usually against this 
concept called deep pattern inspection. We need to find some other way of finding intruders rather breaking someone else encrypted connection at the middle unethically and listen to its communication. That is actually unethical. But some of the people are doing it. Even the attackers can do it. Even anyone can do it. I will show you how it works. So in order to show that how it works, I am using some, uh, what you call it as, web proxy server. Web proxy servers are the servers uh, which used to inspect web communication to detect the attacks. Uh, automatically those servers can detect attacks. Plus, uh, uh, we can manually detect attacks. Uh, so there is an organization called, maybe you know about it, OAS.org. Uh, so OAS, that refers to Open Web Application Security Project. That's well-known organization. Uh, it's there for a long time, 10, 20 years. And so this OAS basically set the guidelines for web application security, plus they release free tools uh, to enhance the web application security, plus learn the web application security. I'll discuss OAS uh, 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 in the lecture today, but before I discuss, I'm using some tool released by OAS called uh, SAP. So OAS released a tool called SAP. You can search for SAP. Uh, so this SAP is a web application proxy server. Let me run this app server. Uh, you can run a, this app server in any way up and open a, a kind of a, a, a connection to your browser and run it. Or you can run it, install in your browser. So install this app in your local machine and then let the browsers to go through that. So first thing is you have to install a SAP server, right? I'm running that SAP as a Docker, Docker image. So in the prompt you can see, I run Docker Compose app. So I put a Docker Compose file in my local machine to up the SAP proxy server. So you don't need to use Docker. Uh, since this SAP proxy has some problems with the Mac machines, uh, I use this uh, Docker. Otherwise on the Ubuntu or any other Linux based machine, you can directly install that. Uh, SAP is written using Java. So if Java runs, it runs anywhere, even it runs on Windows, uh, because it's a Java, Java, Java application. So you just download this Java application and run it, that's it. So it will run the SAP proxy server. I think the latest version of SAP is 2.8. I use 2.7 server for the demonstration. So that's for it as an attack proxy. So we will discuss what kind of attacks they can do later on. Uh, lecture today. So I'm using this SAP proxy uh, to demonstrate you the man in the middle attack of the TLS, right? So this, I have started the SAP proxy. So as I mentioned, I can use it to test some web servers. So there we, we type the URL of the web server and say attack. So then automatically they execute known attacks on the particular web server or the web application and generate a report for you. You can try it later on. So I will show you how do we use that cell as a, a, a local proxy. So you see now, so it gets some data because I have configured my web browser, uh, web browser to go through this app. So I'm running everything in local. So when you go into general and then go to the network setting, you see, I set it up manually to go through this SAP proxy server. So in the local IP and the port number. So when I type anything on this web browser, actually it goes to the internet via my local proxy. So for example, if I type like uh, university.nk here, so it's connected to the University of Town School of Computing website. So it's going through my proxy. So you see, it's going through my uh, proxy, right? Uh, UGSC proxy. So uh, all the communication between the, my browser and the UGSC web server is interrupted here, actually recorded here. So all the get requests and then for uh, post requests plus response to those. So these are the requests and then there are response we can search here. 
request types and then response types and everything we can record it here. So the page basically loaded, right? Through the proxy server. So when you see it's loaded with SSL, so when you click that SSL connection, so you see it's connection established. This UCAC web server is certified by OAS root C. Okay? OAS root C. That is the people who created this proxy server. Actually, University of Columbus identification website is certified by Let's Entry. So not the OAS. But what's happened here? So on the fly, this OWAS proxy has created the certificate for UCSC web server and present it to this browser. And this browser has accepted that as the valid public key and established the encrypted, encrypted session between the browser to the SAP proxy server. Meantime, SAP proxy server will establish a session from the uh, proxy to the any server. So as you may understood, this is now SAP proxy. They put a bogus public key certificate to the user. User has accepted that. And then they have created encryption session here. Meantime, he has established a session here. So this end server here is blind. They, are, they don't know these connections come from the attacker or real user because attacker emulate it as a browser to this. So then this thing, it is a browser. So they set up a connection and he set up a connection with that. So he when actually this attack or this app proxy send a public key certificate generated by himself to the browser and browser accepted that blindly. Why so? Why so? Because the SAP CA certificate, OAS root CA is installed in this browser as trusted CA. So let me show, I go to again security tab and then web certificate button and then authority and you might see some OAS CA is installed. I have installed that previously like I installed a few minutes ago, University of Columbus CA. So there is OWASP root CA, you see, this is installed. When I view that, it accepted by this browser as a trusted certification authority. Since it's accepted as trusted certification authority, certificates on the fly issued to the University of Colombo by this CA is accepted as trusted public key from it by this browser. So it establishes as a cell session. So the end user will not aware of that. So the same thing happens. So when you go to mail, use uh, Gmail, so it's established uh, encrypted connection. It go through the Gmail. It go through my proxy. So when I go back to the proxy, uh, it is actually going through the proxy. Right? And so I will show you uh, the proxy. You see it's coming from Gmail. Google connections, all the all the things they recorded. So, for example, if I sign in uh, using this account, and maybe I change my language to English. Uh, so, it's uh, a lack of language. Uh, so now it's English, and uh, so I can type uh, kind of my username here. Uh, right, so then it will get recorded here. So I can type kind of puzzle here. So it get recorded by the proxy. So when you go to the proxy, and maybe you can you can maybe search for this. Or oh, so that is recorded actually. Uh, let me see how to. Uh, search it here. Search you search for maybe also. You see, uh, there are so many uh, things which goes with the puzzle. Uh, some of they are uh, 
actually you can uh, see my transfer uh, so actually it's passed as plain text uh, in this uh, request uh, so maybe I uh, take uh, not all I take rest request because the parcels go through the request the request form and I search parcel oh, so we have two two files uh, so let's search uh, search uh, parcel uh, on the web request files maybe yes you see google account so this is how the google uh, browser pass parser to the google server. so you see it say parser and this actually i didn't type my correct parser so that's why it prompt me again if i type the correct parser here uh, that is visible here uh, attacker can take it. Uh, so that's not not ethical that's not ethical so the same thing will do by the firewall same thing will do by the attackers so that is what we call man in the middle attacking TLS that goes uh, un, un, undetected if someone installs the root certificate of this man in the middle so in this case man in the middle is OAS so I have installed OAP CA here so as a trusted C so because of that that browser has accepted all these public keys certified by OAS. Similarly, I just showed you how to create your own CD. So if you issue a certificate to some man in the middle and install your own CA in victim's browser, so this victim browser may go into such man in the middle attack. In companies with the deep packet inspection do the same. They force to install the CA firewall in the browser as they can do it manually or they can ask the users to do so or while the software is installed in the organization they already put it in the browser bundle and install there then users are not aware of that so then all the connections will break at the middle so that's practically possible so how do you detect them so when you go to uh, whatever the websites you have to click on this handle and see whether who's certifying that. Actually, you see the browser wants it, but the users are usually users are not aware of it. So they are ne they never ever check that at the time they are going to Gmail or Facebook or whatever. So then uh, you can you use so nicely. So anybody can get your password or anybody can get your credentials. So that's kind of reality. So that is uh, the major weakness of. TLS. TLS can be broken at the middle uh, by using uh, such uh, attacks, a kind of pre setup attacks. So these are not automated, it's kind of pre setup in the organization. So, for example, if you use Gmail in the Internet Cafe, that cafe may already configure for that. If you use Internet in your university, the university uh, uh, browsers are already configured for that. We are not, we are never checking it now. So then uh, you may already it for such man in the middle attacks. So how do you show these things? As I mentioned, uh, after SSL, you have to click that padlock and see whether you certify. For example, if I'm going to this bank, so bank should certify by uh, whatever international certification authority, but by the attack. So if you buy Google, Google sites are certified by certification authority called Google CA or the global site. So then inducers are not known about it. So then they may be a victim for that. So that is actually a uh, man in the middle attack. Similarly, uh, maybe you heard about recently there were some attacks on WhatsApp and Telegraph like application. So they do TLS end to end. So then what type of attack they had then, whether it is a man in the middle attack or whether it is a kind of a uh, different attack. Actually, 
so there is a different attack. So I will describe that attack and go to the uh, move to the lecture today, so you may understand uh, the importance of web security. All right? Uh, okay. Let's let's go to the attack. Right. So in this particular attack, what we call media hijacking, so there what happened, some malware which is infected in the phones get access to the media content. Actually, for example, let's say WhatsApp, WhatsApp set up into a TLS connection, encrypted connection between sender and the recipient. So no one at the middle will look at those content unless otherwise, they, someone execute this man in the middle attack, which I just showed, right? And so usually it's not there such man in the middle attack. Data is encrypted and trained. However, so when this WhatsApp application store the data in your phone, they store it in the plain text format. Because of that, the malware runs on the same phone can access to that and alter it. So the application are not aware that malware are altering it. So then application may think it is a correct data which we receive and act on it. So that is the problem. So that shows us this. So when you think about the data in any web application, they are in three states. Three states. One, what we call it as at rest, other in transit, other in use. So so basically, whatever we say in our phone or the hard disk we, or the web server, we call it as data at rest. So then when we transfer the data, move the data from web server to the browser, so data is in transit. When that particular application use that data, data it in use. So we protect the data in web application most of the cases when data it in transit. The TLS which we discussed so far apply for the data in transit, not the data at rest. So that's why uh, this guy malware can act, act on it. So this is data on rest. Right. So, so that is serious problem. So when you think about our application, we only focus this. That is wrong. So someone can focus here and there and attack you. you. You realize that already there are such attacks. So then how do you secure then a web application? That is not so simple as we think. So most of the companies and organizations just set up a TLS web server and connect from the browser and assume everything is fine. So that is not. So the web application is a multi-tier architecture. There are web servers, there are database servers, there are application servers, talk to each other in different different levels, and different different applications runs on them. So, so, so for example, so when you think about the web application, there are some attacks in the application layer. There are some attacks in the user layer. So for example, even everything is protected perfectly, if there is a keylogger installed, user application, user machine, so then key, that keylogger can connect your username and password. We cannot stop that. So then that attack is in the user layer. So if everything is get protected, if user are not aware of phishing attacks and type his username at the phishing website voluntary, we will discuss phishing later on anyway, phishing website voluntary, so we cannot stop, technology cannot stop that. That is problem of user. That is the problem of user layer. So we need to think about when we do web application security, we need to think about the user layer as well. Similarly, we have to think about the application layer. Application layer, there are so many attacks, injection attacks, scripting attacks, precise scripting attacks, authentication attacks, unvalidated inputs attacks, and so on. So we discuss few of them today here. And then we go into network layer. There might be a man in the middle attack, which I just demonstrated you. There might be some DNS attack, DNS moving. I'll discuss in different way. And then there are packet sniffing attack, like someone can use kind of a wire shark to sniff the packets. So like there are attacks on the network layer. We have a solution, straightforward solution here, that is TLS. 
transpolar security TLS. Obviously, TLS work unless otherwise it someone is phased enough, a uh, man in the middle attack, or someone is using deep packet interaction. Unless otherwise, TLS works in the network layer for the web application security. But we need to concern the application layer. Plus, we need to concern user layer. We need to concern server layer. If someone attacks the servers, then they can get ex ex exploited because we store our web applications on the servers as plain text. So someone can execute denial of service attack on the server. Our data application address is not secure. So, so there are so many requirements I discussed in the last week as well in my last lecture. So we have a requirement authentication, integrity, confidentiality, non-repudiation, and availability. These are the five I discussed in the last, last lecture. So among that, I remove temporary availability because availability requirements can be achieved using redundant service, load balancing, and so on and so on. The other four is most. For other four, I have added one more call authorization. So basically, in any application, web application or whatever, so there are three steps you need to be very clear. One is identification. This is not in the slide. And then authentication and authorization. So identification is kind of getting your information, that is your username and the password. After that, we enter into a process called authentication. Authentication is to verify whether you are a correct user, right? Then after you finish the authentication, you move on to authorization. Authorization check whether you have right access to the files, right? So basically, the, the authentication and authorization are very important. Identification anyway, just get a username and password. You can skip that. Authentication is the process of verifying you are the correct user. Authorization is after verifying, assigning the correct access rights. So in addition to that, so confidential you need to be there. No one will be able to see that in it. Integrity should be there. No one need to be able to change that. And non-repetition should be there. So like, uh, especially in the transaction, no one will be able to deny it. That if someday, someone deny, we should be able to take that person to court. And if you take some person to court, there should be legally valid evidence. So in the web application transactions, we have to collect that. But actually, honestly speaking, non repudiation is not there anymore. So even we do credit card transaction, we use TLS protocol there. So there are obviously no non repudiation. So if you want to study web application security, the OAS is a very good website to refer. So they have a lot of tools uh, available. I have already demonstrated one tool. So let's call it as uh, SAP proxy. So in addition to that, there are a couple of tools, uh, learning materials, slides available on this website. Uh, visit your website and explore it yourself after the lecture. Right, let's get back to this web application security problem. What is the problem? So basically, I discussed TLS will uh, 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 create end-to-end -end encryption. Unless otherwise this firewall is a deep packet infection firewall. So usually SSL connection is not break at the firewall. So that means if anybody who can attack the servers through this encryption, that's why firewall breaking. But firewall are breaking it on the way of unethical way. That means, so even if break, so firewall can of course, it exam attacks, but still we are not secure. So basically, attacker get an encrypted channel through the TLS to attack our information systems. So that is the problem. So network layer kind of protected, unless otherwise there are no man in the middle attack. However, our application layer, our code is not secure. We are not thinking about our code, business logic, and so and so. Bugs in this code may open possibilities to those attackers to get into your system through an encrypted channel, through TLS. TLS may not do this, stop that. TLS only encrypt the channel. So then, attacker attack you through TLS. So how do you stop that? 
And before we discuss how to stop that, we should uh, uh, know about uh, what are the attacks. What are the attacks available? So in the OAS, publish top 10 attacks happens on the web application in somewhere around 2013, and they have again published a new list in somewhere around 2017. Let's have a look what was the top 10 attacks in 2013. So the first one is most, most popular attack at that time was called as cost right scripting or CSS attacks. So there is a version called cost right scripting for three or two. So the same thing. So this is the most popular attack. Then there was an attack called injection clause. So maybe you heard about SQL injection that is comes under injection clause. And then there is an attack called unvalidated input. So it's, I will show you what happens if you use validated input and where we should validate it when you move. And then of course buffer overflow attacks, especially your web application implemented in C like languages or like binary compiled languages. <coughs> and then there yeah, is a buffer overflow attack. And then error handling problems. And then there is a type of attack called broken authentication. Authentication session can be broken at the middle you, by hijacking the cookies because authentication sessions are maintained by cookies. And then there is an attack called broken access control because you do authentication, web is stateless protocol, so we have to maintain the sessions. Sessions maintain using cookies or hidden fields on the web page. So if you use hidden fields on the web page, access control can be broken. I will show you that room. And then obviously, insecure storage. That means when you store the data, so someone can attack it. And then the are of service attack. That means I kind of stop accessing your country and insecure configuration management. So you don't do proper configuration. So these are the top 10 attack in 2017. After four years, five years, roughly, so they have published the list again, revising it. So you might see the attacks in 2013 are still visible. And they have added new types as well. But you see, now the injection can go to the most popular kind of attacks. And cross site can become kind of sold to some extent. So I will let you know why. But the rest is almost there. So the broken authentication problem is there. So they have renamed like this yeah, one attack, what we call it as here. Uh, uh, this one. Uh, insecure storage one, they have renamed it as uh, sensitive data expo by generalizing it. So that is discussed about privacy of the users. And then they, there is a new attack called XML, XML external entities and broken attack, access control attack is still there. Misconfiguration problems are still there. Uh, deserialization is a new kind of attack happens nowadays. And then and then vulnerable components we use in our application development, especially we use Docker's right now, Docker and Kubernetes, when you use that, that might happen. And then log management uh, issues are there. So these are the top 10 which we should uh, think about right now. So let's go through one by one roughly to give you an idea about what are those attacks and how can we mitigate them. So first, most most kind of uh, most popular attack over the internet is uh, in web application is injection attacks. There are so many injection types: uh, SQL injection, file injection, and so and so. All those injection attacks, what happen? We take untrusted inputs without validation. So when you take untrusted input from the users to our servers without validating, so we are exposed to the injection attacks. So most popular injection type is SQL injection. In the SQL injection, what happened? Clients type, uh, instead of a data, clients might type SQL queries. So if you don't validate what client types, so then you, you may execute SQLs on your backend databases without thinking about the input. So some intelligent hackers they might send some uh, um, inbuilt kind of uh, SQL statement to you. So by doing that, they might take your passwords, 
they might take sometimes entire database in the back end to their side. So this is a very simple example, that type of SQL injection uh, on the username, password, may not anymore, I guess, because most of the people now use frameworks to develop that, but still there are variations available. So this simple example attack, as you may show you, there is a web page where home which take the username and password and submit to the backend application. How this backend application, this is backend application code look like, how they do after they get the username and password from the end user, web browser, backend server application, just run a select for example, select from, from this table users, where are username equal this and password equal that. So if that return is one, then there is a user with the username and the password. So then they let that user to log in. So that's a simple thing you should do. Uh, so uh, some web application do. If you do that thing, so what's happen if some bad guy, they might type instead of username, they might type something like that. Uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, whatever admin, uh, it might come out kind of the same color. Uh, and then caught quite in the same color. So if someone type that, so then the select query, which is on the back end may look like that. That means it may finish here after admin commenting the password part because you don't check whether this character is there from the user side. So then what happens, it returns all the, it returns the one because there is usually a user called admin. So then you can log in as admin to this web application. Similarly, so in this shows one on one attack. So for example, if you kind of run a select query for table to display something, so which match some statements. So one can, so for example, there is a website called movie theater. They run this query in the get as a get query. So we, you can add this at the end of this get query. So you say whatever ID and then say O oh, one equal one. So one equal one is always true. So then O part is always true because of that, whatever you type in match or non match, the, this is particular SQL for the returns. So that means it returns all the data. So these are the simple things. Uh, how do you stop that? So if you want to stop that, you have to kind of uh, uh, validate your input. So you have to validate your input. So most of the time we are using JavaScript to validate our input at the client side. That's what we call it as client side validation. So you should understand that client side validation is not enough. So I already demonstrated this web application proxies. So, right? So, which basically break the connection of the middle. Whatever you validate as a client can break by the attack at the middle and insert malicious data. So then server may process those malicious data. So the client validation or the browser validation can easily bypass by the attackers. For example, so let's say you have implemented some shopping cart which uh, sells some books and there you have hidden fields which uh, hidden the price of this book. So because in the one page to other page you are going on, you have to kind of find it out the price. So this, whatever the person who implement that, implement in, in the bad way. So they put the price of this book as the, in my example, price of this book as the hidden value. So if the attacker noticed that, so they can maybe set it up a web application, proxy at the meeting, intercept this one, and get this in field and edit that manually to some other value and forward to the your server. So, so you don't assume, you assume that that can't be done, but that can. There are what we call it as web application proxy. I already showed that using the SAP proxy, you can intercept this request, get request, or post request, actually this is post request at the middle and alter this request manually and forward to the web server. So then maybe he can set its value to be zero. So then 
you may buy the book for zero price, zero, zero, uh, zero dollars or zero rupees, like that. So then you see the result is serious. So the validation should be handled client side of this, it, it is not enough. So the same strength, the validation must handle at the server side as well. Server side validation need to be done. So if you do server side validation, if someone alter this, you may be able to detect that. So in the basic things, never trust input from the users. Users are not always genuine users. Users you feel or users you get may be a trusted user and untrusted user. So the validation happens on the service uh, times I can bypass. So because of that, you have to do some filtering at the server side. When you do filtering, there is what we call positive filtering and so on. We will discuss when you move on. How do you prevent kind of those injection attacks? It may be a skill injection, it may be some direct injection of the bad data your web application, how do you stop that? So in the SQL, there are method for parameterized queries. You can use those parameterized queries, then SQL engine itself detect if someone needs a uh, malicious queries because if you use parameterizing this, only intended query will execute. The attackers may not be able to inject other queries. So then we can use stored procedures and we can do escape using that means instead of putting the user input as it is you can put escape character and put it there so then it may not interfere by this sql like whatever the characters sql characters because they present to the server side in the different format but in the browser knows how to interpret it uh, and then uh, we can do whitelist that is positive filtering that means they specify which characters that allow and others we can reject and we can do some other privilege settings as well saying this user can do that and so on in the backend side so if someone then get into uh, inside the bad queries that may not run because in the database side you have good precautions right let's have a look other kind of popular attack what we call broken authentication a broken noise indication basically what the attacker do attacker try to hijack your session IDs or attacker try to hijack your username and password and then try to impersonate you. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, in order to stop that, you have to enforce the users to use strong password and you should not store username and password as plain text. We discuss it, we have to store it the salt and hash values and whatever the communication between browser and the web server we should use TLS but you now know even if you use TLS there are some attacks so we must use TLS if not then there are obviously very huge volume of attack can be executed and when you do implement the authentication sometimes we can have much better authentication perhaps some applications you know now they use SMS instead of using in password, they send a PIN number to your phone and using that PIN number to authenticate. That may create some other problems as well, I'll discuss later on, but somehow we have to have additional precautions taken in the authentication. Otherwise, some people may, drop, may break that at the middle and then get access to data. Then third popular tag type, Sensitive data exposed, that means people may store the confidential data on the servers and the browsers as cookies in plain text or in kind of unprotected manner. So attackers may take your sensitive data while this data is rest, while they're storing this data. So that is uh, uh, what we call it as previously no obstructing call it an insecure storage. So basically, uh, insecure storage, uh, maybe in your database you might be storing insecure. Some people still use 
play, still store using impulse playing tricks in the database. Some people use weak algorithms. Some people store credit card numbers as plain text. So then in some way we have to actually get into those databases and the data at rest, they can steal the data. So they are attacking the data at rest, not attacking data in transit. So most importantly, you kind of forget about why you are and you might forget about this insecure, the secure storage in the data, especially when you are in the log files. I will let you know an example. So for example, let's say you implement a shopping card application where you handle credit card numbers. So credit card numbers are supposed to be stored in the databases in kind of encrypted or the protected manner. So then, so you perfectly do that. Let's say you do that perfectly in your databases. But if someone stores some, uh, any, sends some credit card number, or maybe he don't have enough credits in the bank, then there might be error of course, since that credit card number may not have enough credit. So if such errors occur, you might write it in to a log files. Most of the applications, as you know, log files are plain text files. So, so since error occurs, you might write the credit card number and the, which error occur into the log file in plain text online. Then you might, might attack a group. Attacker may not try to attack your database because database he knows you put precautions and it will be protected. But in the log files, you neglect it. So in the log files, you have the same information, same credit card numbers in the plain text format. Then why should you attack, attack database instead? They can have a look on the log files. So, like that. So, what the message I want to pass it here sensitive data you need to identify. Where yeah, it is still, it doesn't matter with the database or block files, you have to work at the sensitive data at all the places when this data at rest, otherwise, you are in trouble. Then, fourth common type of attacks which we can see XML entities. So, usually, with this attack in the browsers, non browsers, find some mechanism to load. XML entities from XML documents and XML content from external files. So some browsers let this feature to load files from local machines. The attacker may misuse the uh, XML external entities loading feature on the browser to load local files instead of loading XML files from the remote entities. So if that happens, the browser attacker will be able to load conventional files in your uh, client machine. So that attack is common, but we can easily stop that by turning off the XML processing features. We can refer to the ones they have described ways of doing. It. And then the fifth type of attack is broken access control. With the broken access control, and uh, the attacker will break access control mechanism at the middle. So you think you have properly implemented the access control mechanism after the authentication. So what attacker may break it? So as I mentioned, after your authentication, you have to maintain the session. So if some attacker access the session, so then you get the same access levels. So there are so many methods of broke the session. That means we have to be careful in session management. If you are not careful in session management, attacker can break or break your access control. So session management in the way usually happen using cookies. So I will discuss cookie management as well because of that. So basically, you know, when someone log into that, so this website is logging information stored in the session ID in your browser. But session IDs are more important than password as well because the session ID tells this is the correct user particular time period in this particular time period. So if someone get that session ID, they can incarcerate you within the same period and they can do some privilege expression and many more. Because of that, 
you have to be very careful in any position. That means if some attack people is on you, obviously you have to time off. If someone closes the browser window, you have to automatically uh, terminate the sessions. You should not allow session in between cross tabs. If you lose your one tab, is logged into your cloud bank, and there's a session opening there, that session can access by the other tab. So other tab may infect it. So this infected tab can access the session and be in bank tab, like that. So then, uh, especially, you need to be careful. Most of the session IDs generated by the frameworks. You are not generating those session IDs. You are usually using web development frameworks. So those web development frameworks handle the session ID for you. There are plus minus points there. Obviously, if you use frameworks, you are not doing it. Those frameworks most of the time are parameters. So because of that, they might handle the proper. So that is the good side. In the bad side is, so some of these frameworks may have bugs, but you don't have any control out there. So then, you, you, if you use these frameworks, you are generating the session ID which exposed to the attackers. And as I mentioned, most of the sessions store as cookies on the browsers, so then cookie management is also important. So like, how do you store the cookies? So the, there are different uh, configuration parameters when you store cookies. There are type of cookies called HTTP only cookies. So then there are uh, HTTP type called secure cookies so that prevent uh, some attacks. So for example, if you define cookie as secure cookie, that cookie is submit from your browser to the server only by HTTPS. If there is a plain text connection, that cookie may not send. So somebody at the middle cannot take it. HTTP only cookies submit only for the web pages. So if that script, some Google script, try to hijack your session ID and since try to send it through the script to some somewhere else, so that may not allow by the browser to define the cookie as HTTP only cookies. So that is submit only to a web page to the web server. Like that, there are some parameters which we can use in the cookie management. So those parameters we have to use otherwise, so some people might use those cookies, get the your session cookies and break, break your access control mechanisms at the middle. Then the next security vulnerability which we can see is kind of a misconfiguration security misconfiguration in the servers, that happens everywhere. So especially when you set up a web servers or other frameworks, you just install them and use it. You even sometimes forget to change the admin password. So let's use PHP or whatever frameworks or WordPress, there are default using passwords and some kind of default configurations. So if you want to get more security, you have to change those things but you sometimes forget to do so. So that ended up with the security misconfiguration. And then obviously cross-site scripting is still visible even though people have taken so many measurements to stop that. In the cross-site scripting what's happened, so some people try to execute a script on your privilege, on your browser, and steal cookies and other sensitive data. So on your browser. So there are two types of cross-site scripting uh, can be, uh, it's visible. So what we call it a reflected cross-site scripting and stored cross-site scripting. In the reflected strings, strings reflected attacks, it happens. So attack uh, will inject script into your get statements. So that script will go to the server Server doesn't know there's a script inverted, so server send you back the page with that script. So then your browser load that page with Boga script in your browser. So that script actually comes from your web server, whatever correct web server. So then the whatever browser let this script to execute. So then that script can hijack some information. And the other type stored cross-site scripting used by the forums. So you know there are forums 
which you can post some comments, chat, and so on. Instead of putting chat, chat, and the comments, you might type scripts there. So those scripts are available in the forums. So without knowing that, you may go to this uh, to check the user feedbacks or user comments on the news blogs or some other websites. So then, so without knowledge, these scripts will execute on the background, which is embedded in the forum, forum post. So that is called stored process. So in order to show you uh, kind of a feeling how those code types between works, I use simple example. So you see there is a web form which do some submit some data. And then in the back end, there is a program. Uh, I think this is a some Java program which uh, uh, read that data and send back a hello message. So this, this is simply what they do. They get this means data and send back to users in hello, how are you like by embedding your name. So they put the name, but taking the name from the user and put it back to the user. So backend program here, read that name, user enter, and build the web page with text HTML web page embedded in this name. So assuming this name always the user name. But in case of prospect is scripting attack, that name would maybe a script, script something like that. So this script will basically then put it into the end browser and that script will run on the end browser. So this script perhaps can read your cookies and then force that cookie to some other people like it. So, so a tag will get a chance to run the scripts. If you just put invalidated input to the back to the user. So how do you prevent validate your inputs? So that's the simple answer. So you have to validate your input and see whether there are uh, specific characters like this data uh, and signs are available, and scripting characters are available like that. Especially if you run the forum, you should uh, allow only the SQLs in the forums, uh, uh, letters, because people only need letters to type them, and that you can do kind of filtering. So when you do filtering, there are two categories of filtering. But you call it as positive filtering and negative filtering. And the positive filtering specifies what is allowed. Anything that's not much is rejected. In the negative filtering, you say what is not allowed. Everything is goes. So basically, we have to do positive filtering. We should do what we should tell what we allow. Because if you try to say what is not allowed, we may miss something. So, but you say what is allowed. So whatever the rest we use is not allowed. So we are safe. And also we can specify characters that we are accepting. So then users are restricted to that. Users may not be able to give, uh, feed you with the uh, attacks or the scripts. Then there are the variation of cross site scripting attack called cross site request forgery. So using that actually, attackers uh, trying to take the session from your browser. So the same thing as we discussed previously. So in order to do that, so always we need to find it out uh, where this uh, next page comes from, because after logins, so the, we need to maintain sessions. So we always need to find it out where this session refers to. So this re session refers to from the previous page, if somebody else outside your domain referring this session and try to access that you can reject it because it's you should know that is attack. In addition to that, if you're handling some confidential response, you need to add some other precautions like some science response or authentication or maybe capture like that. So then you know that is not automated attack. So it's a humans there, yeah, then humans want to know them, then you know the real user is there, not the attack or the script. So then the other, other kind of new problems what we can see is insecure decentralization. So basically, when you want to communicate through web application, we use serialized objects. So especially Java, JavaScript, we use objects. 
So objects in serialized object and sensor are other side decentralize it and use it. So there are attacks seen. So some bad guys uh, create object with malware. So the browsers are not aware of that. Browser get the serialized object, browser deserialize it. So then this deserialized object may consist of malware. So then that malware may execute in the browser. And then the next type of attacks we can see is uh, uh, vulnerabilities in components. You know, nowadays most of the web application developments or the online application based on components or different containers. So previously it was VMs. So now everyone uses containers. So when you use containers, what you call Docker containers, especially, so those containers consist of different different small functions. So so those containers sometimes share same VM. So if one container get compromised, data of that container may be accessed by the other container, which runs on the same operating system. So the containers may attackers may use containers to spread exploits. So these containers, Docker containers, and the security of Docker containers are still very new, and people are kind of thinking how do we protect it because people are still studying how the attackers are using it. So attackers also still studying how they can misuse those local controllers and so on. But in near future, that might be become a big problem. So now maybe 2017 list, it is A9, 9, but maybe in next few years, maybe it become A1, because everybody use containers those containers may have plenty of problems. And in the top 10, in the final one, insertion, login, and monitoring. So basically, I already mentioned the problem of login. Even we do login, we need to be careful. We should not output compilation information. Plus, when you do login, sometimes we have, actually, when, when problems occur, sometimes we may see we don't have proper login information. So sometimes an application may logs, but those logs are not go. These logs we are not monitoring properly. So, so these are two things. Creating the necessary log is one thing, and then monitoring those logs is other thing. So most of the application actually creating the logs. But lagging part is we don't have systems in place to monitor those logs. So we may release beyond that, and we may, we may realize we are under attack maybe after that. So if we monitor it properly, perhaps before the attacks, we may be able to identify that. So because of that, we say insertion, login, and monitoring is a problem nowadays, so we should be careful on that. Okay, so if we want to learn those things in detail, if you want to find it out how it works and so on, there is a vulnerable web application which is developed by OWASP called WebGo. This screen is kind of old screen, but there are new versions available, WebGo new versions. You can search OWASP website and download this WebGo. WebGo is a web application which implemented, which has those weaknesses. So then using this sub proxy and a browser, you can follow these web code sessions. So those web code sessions, uh, by following them, you can self-study how those attacks work, and there are instructions in this web code that uh, shows you how to fix those. So by following those and fixing those, you can learn this web application security, and you can learn how do you implement a secure web application, which has minimum problems. Obviously, we may not be able to handle the problems, but we have to develop the problems as much as possible with less problems. We have to develop systems with less problems. We can learn how to do so with web code. With that, I can conclude the lecture today where I discuss web application as we well demonstrate and the problem with the TLS which manage the middle attack and so on. 
So that is kind of end of the lecture today. So we can take the rest of the time uh, for answering questions uh, from the uh, students. Uh, okay, so there are questions already typed. So I will uh, continue from where I stood. Uh, Uh, so, so the, there was a question saying, can I increase browser, browser security by with Zerity? Actually, we can uh, provide the, uh, not it, browser security, we can create uh, client authentication. That means we can authenticate the uh, client side, browser side with the certificates. So still the, uh, the web application security like cross-site scripting injections are there. Even we use certificate that may not prevent it, but we can do kind of authentication and the browser. Otherwise, TLS only authenticate web server. Then there was a question: How to how to prevent injection attacks? In order to prevent injection attacks, the simple answer is uh, uh, validate your inputs. Validate your inputs. Not only the client side using JavaScript, but also at the server side. So there are frameworks already available. I forget those names, you can search. There are plenty of uh, frameworks available. So when you get the input from the client, you can pass that input to those frameworks. The frameworks basically will validate your interest and whether it consists of injection tools or not. So then if the framework clear it up, you can use that like that. You can, you can the simple answer is validate your input at the client side, and you must do it at the server side. And then there is a question, I have used Wireshark, not OWASP. Can you please explain the difference between these two tools? Uh, Wireshark actually look at the uh, network traffic, TCP traffic, at the IP layer. The OWASP SAT proxy, which I show, is not a packet sniffer. Wireshark is a packet sniffer. Packet sniffing means they are basically sniffing entire packets floating through the network in the IP layer. That's how Wireshark works. OASAP works in a different way. OASAP is a proxy server. Uh, OASAP is organization actually. SAP is the tool which I show. SAP is a proxy server. Proxy server means they take a, a connection from one, one site and pass it to the other side. So usually in your uh, organization, you are using web application proxies, web proxies to make the web browsing efficient and to filter the web communication. So the SAP proxy which I demonstrated was the same thing. The proxy servers basically get the web request from the browsers and pass to the web servers in the outside world. So since proxy intercept is at the middle, proxy can save the country. What I demonstrated is, if your traffic is a TLS traffic, encrypted traffic, then the web proxy may not see that. What they are supposed to do is just pass it to the outside without looking at it. But there are unethical ways which I show you. Then the web pro proxy can send you a Google certificate to your browser. Then your browser can establish a security connection, encrypted connection to the proxy, not to the final entity like Google. So then the proxy at the middle will record your confidential communication. So that's the difference. Where OWASP SAP is the web proxy. Wireshark is the packet server. Then there was a question, is it possible to show the demo on how to analyze sale cookies on the proxy? I will see if time permits, I will try to show a demo. And then there was a question uh, asking from uh, Roy, uh, if you don't mind, can you please improve your uh, microphone? It's quite noisy because I am facing problems from the stars. Nice in your work. Uh, thanks for the comments. Uh, actually, 
I will try my best to improve that. And also I have some, these days I have some problem with my throat. So that may be the reason you are getting not good voice. Sorry about it. I will try my best to improve that. Thank you for the comments. Otherwise, I don't know because I don't know how do you hear about it. So please comment like that. If, if you can't see my windows, you can't hear my words properly, please let me know so then I can adjust that. Thanks, Lord. And then there was the uh, question saying, can you please give me an example in DC relaxation? So it's, 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 uh, I can provide you some sample codes later on if you wish. That is not uh, a magic, for example. Someone can write a, uh, so you know, serialization may, uh, if you pass Java objects, whatever objects within browser and the server, so we do serialize and pass it to the other side, the other side is serialized. So there is an object in the serialized mode in the uh, remote server and load it to browser. And then before using that, browser will be serialized. So codes may consist of data plus some objects. So some people might use that uh, to send malware. So that's what they call it as DC realization problem. I will try to find some examples to, to demonstrate that. Maybe later on I will show some example of this problem. Right, I don't have right now access to this example. Okay. So then there was a question from Nazi, how to detect the first um, actually, usually, you know, so, so in my examples, I manually set the proxy. But in the most of the network configuration, the proxy is automatic. So for example, when you go to the web, most of the organization, you are going through a proxy server. So that is automatic, automatic. So all the web traffic, they capture and put it to a proxy server by, by force. So it always goes through the proxy server. So there are, uh, you, can, you can do different tests uh, for detecting proxies. For example, if you, there are uh, websites which we say no. Uh, so for example, let's say you are using inside the network and you use virtual or bogus IP address, that means private IP address. So if you are using private IP address, if you want to go online, then you have to go through a proxy. So you always go through a proxy. If your IP address is a uh, private IP address, it's not a public IP address, then you always go through the proxy. So it's important not detecting the proxy. Actually, it is important whether that proxy is doing man in the middle attack. So that is important. So, so most of us, 99% of us, when you go to the internet, it always goes through some proxy because more, most of the organizations, they use uh, bogus IPs or private IP address within the organization and use application uh, proxies to interface it with the internet. So that's, we always go through the proxy in kind of a proxy. Uh, so, but these web proxies, bad web proxies may break your connection at the middle. That's uh, what you have to detect. So there, how do you detect it? So you have to click on this padlock button and you go to this SSL or TLS websites. There is a small padlock TLS symbols on the browser. You just click that. That tells you which CA certified that the public key of N. So basically, you have to check with some places and to understand Google is certified by this particular CA. Maybe Facebook is certified by particular CA. You have to have this pre knowledge. So if you have that pre knowledge, then you go to somewhere and click that button and see that Facebook certificate is certified by someone else, then you know, okay, you are under man in the middle attack. So if you see the Google is certified by someone else, not the Google CA, then you know, okay, you are under some kind of man in the middle attack. So that's how you can detect. Uh, and then there was a question from Nancy. Web proxy software you need, you use in the lecture, it is free to download? Yes, it is free. The 
Netflix. Uh, it's works on Windows because it's a Java. It's a Java program. You can download from OWASP website. It's called OWASP Self Proxy. Attack Self is it is it baby proxy? It's free. You can search and download. Right. I think I have answered all the questions in the list, and uh, you have realized the web is not kind of a safe place as we feel. So that's why we need to protect it. That's why we need this kind of uh, education programs to educate you on cybersecurity. Uh, you understand how it's going, what's going on, and then you can protect yourself and you can spread the message to your colleagues. And then they can take uh, small actions to protect their information themselves. And then that, that's why the objective of them is kind of serious. I think we are kind of uh, towards the end of the session now. If you have, I can answer. So I think uh, almost I have answered the questions. Perhaps we can stop the sessions today. Is that okay? I, any other questions? Or no? The Bangladesh fight, anything um, you want to say sir, that's finished? Sir, one thing. Uh, yes. Sometimes your voice is so much clear and sometimes in uh, is rough so no, i request you if you use a headphone so sound is so much clear it, okay so in the next lecture i will use a headphone yes so then that's why i'm using a computer mic maybe yeah. that's a problem other that thing sound is that maybe throat has some problem uh, as a both effect perhaps yes so that's, next next lecture definitely i'll use a mic a microphone and then that might get improved. Okay, sir. So dear participants, okay. have you any questions? Anyone? Okay, then we close the session then okay so, so see you back in next saturday right okay sir. thank you sir thank you thank you very much